Ikuku. Uh, I'm actually a software engineer at IBM Watson Life. But in my free time, I like to build ambitious web applications using Ember.js and Ruby on Rails. And for my talk today, I'll be talking about Ember and Ember CLI and how it really made me fall in love with front-end web development. So y'all are probably wondering, what is Ember? Just by a show of hands, how many of y'all have used Ember before or dabbled with it? See a few hands out there. Um, <laughs> To be honest, when I, like, whenever I first started my search for a JS framework to use about a year or so ago, um, I hadn't really heard that much about Ember. During the time, Backbone, Angular were like really the main two, and React was just gaining traction. Um, so let's see what Ember really is. Per their website, they describe it as a framework for creating ambitious web applications. I've used Ember in various projects over the last year, and with each project, I just fall more and more in love with it. Sounds like a romantic relationship. <laughs> but um, <laughs> So why did I choose Ember over other frameworks? And I've always been asked this question, and I most of the time give technical answers. But for the like, purpose of this talk, I'm going to give my answers in two ways. I'm going to talk about Ember, or why I like Ember as a designer, and why I like Ember as a developer. And I guess context, I have a degree in computer science and a degree in graphic design. So that's why. Um, so let's start off with why, what I like about Ember as a designer. So I started using Ember because I was redesigning Notre Dame's class search interface. Um, and the UI I had mocked up didn't really seem doable with Ruby on Rails. So I needed a way to make an ambitious UI. So here's the interface in question. As you can see, it's a three column view. And once again, I had no idea how I've done this using straight Rails. So I started looking into front-end frameworks to make the front-end development process easier, and Ember seemed to be a strong contender. And here's the final UI. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping of what I um, designed and sketch, but um, as you can see, it kind of like matches up pretty clearly. And I was able to implement the MVP for this three-column view in about eight hours, so like I guess one workday. And I was able to like, save a lot of development time on this um, application, primarily due to Ember and its router, which I'll discuss later. And I want to show you another ambitious UI that I made. So what you see here is a lightweight mach machine learning classifier. And this was built using Django in the back end and Ember in the front end for my data mining final class project. It's kind of a completely different user experience but it was just as painless to develop um, as a class search application. And you're probably wondering how Ember makes building these UIs so painless and straightforward. And I got an answer for that. There we go. All right. The moment y'all have been waiting for. <laughs> but I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ember's router is very powerful, and it has this concept of nesting your roots. And with Ember, um, with Ember as a framework, your data, your URLs slash roots, UI, and application state are all in sync with one another. Um, so yeah, you saw that concept of nested roots within the class search application as you had that three column view, and each of those were just um, roots nested in with, um, within one another. So this is an example router file for an, for an Ember application. As you can see, the show or detail view for contacts is nested underneath um, that contacts root. And here's how this root renders out. At the top um, level in the red, we have the application root, which all other roots are um, um, nested into, well, nested and rendered into. The contacts template is rendered into the application roots outlet, which is where, um, and then, well, I guess context. An outlet is a way for in a template file to tell the root where to render its relevant template. Um, so yeah, so when we're at the context root, that context template is rendered into that application root's outlet. And then in the contact detail um, root, so whenever we navigate to a specific ID, it is rendered into that context root outlet. So it's like an outlet in an outlet inception. Yeah, but um, <laughs> now given this public URL, you can share this URL with anybody and the state of the application would be the same. And that's how, um, at least a simple level, how routing works in Ember. So I'm going to talk about another reason why I like <coughs> Ember. 
So as you saw in class search, there were some pretty nice animations from view to view, and those actually were just handled by vanilla CSS um, in combination with Ember's like nested roots. But sometimes you want more dynamic and engaging animations between your roots and their views. So this is where Liquid Fire comes into play. It's an animation and transitions library built by Edward Faulkner. Liquid Fire makes it simple to create appealing yet engaging animations between the roots within your Ember application. So let's see an example. So as you can see here, there's a simple sliding motion between the views um, in this application, and that's all being handled by Liquid Fire. And this is just like a very, very basic example. But yeah, in context, it's just an app I'm working on in my free time, but yeah. And you're, probably one, and you're probably thinking, oh wow, that must have been really complicated to get working. Well, let's see how the code looks. First, we're gonna use Ember CLI to install Liquid Fire. And so, like I mentioned earlier, um, inside of a, your Ember application, um, a template is rendered, well, my bad, a, t a root is able to determine where to render its template given the parent like template's outlet. So with Liquid Fire, you have to change this outlet to a liquid outlet. And basically what it's doing is isolating or it's being able to say like, hey, I, I wanna animate this part of the template into the next view. And then all you have to do is define a transitions.js file that tells Liquid Fire what transitions to use between the different routes. Liquid Fire ships with default transitions such as to left, to right, to up, and to down, and then one more explode, which kind of like, like zooms in on it. <laughs> but you can also write custom animations and transitions if you show choose. And this was essentially my reaction after getting Liquid Fire up and running. It was hard for me to believe that it was like actually that simple to, um, to use and just adding these engaging yet appealing animations between the different views in my, uh, sorry, app. So that's enough of a talk about why I like Ember as a designer, kind of short and sweet, but you know, I feel like a lot of y'all are developers, so let's talk about why I like Ember as a developer. Um, how many of you here have done Ruby on Rails development? Okay, more hands than people that heard about Ember, cool. Um, so Ember's core philosophy of convention over configuration really resonated with me, especially since I was just coming to the framework after having learned Ruby on Rails. And by reducing the number of decisions I had to make in terms of file organization, build processes, et cetera, I was just able to hit the ground running in developing my application. Additionally, it really makes it easy to look at open source Ember applications and projects, for example, slash inspiration, because it's just easy to find all of the relevant business logic within that application. And another question, how many of y'all have used handlebars for templating on the front end? All right, more hands than rails, cool. Um, so if you've ever used handlebars for templating, you'll feel right at home with Ember's um, templating system called HTML bars. It's essentially a variant of handlebars, but rather than um, creating a string, it's building up a DOM object, and it has some more niceties to it that play nice with Ember and um, its templating system. Also, defining actions within Ember application is pretty trivial. Let's look at an example for a sign in action. So here's Page and Liker. It's uh, an Ember application I built to unlike those embarrassing Facebook pages that bored high school Ihani decided to like extensively. <laughs> um, so we're focused on the Facebook sign-in button in the top right. Let's see how we'd imp implement this login action with some help from Ember and Ember Simple Law. <coughs> Excuse me. So on this button, we've given it the sign-in action on um, for the on-click event. So. Um, Guess context, whenever you define an action um, on any tag within the front end, it's just going to automatically default to like on click. So next we need to tell the controller how to handle this action. In this controller, we are defining our sign-in action to authenticate the user using Facebook Connect when the sign-in button is clicked. And then after a, tra a successful transition uh, or my bad, a successful authentication, we're gonna transition to the likes route and you're done. And it was really mad simple. 
going further with actions, you can pass in you can pass in like objects into the actions themselves, such as like an instance of a model in order to perform actions on those objects. So if you wanted to delete an object, for example, you could like pass it into an action and then call uh, delete from Ember data, which I'll talk about later. And yeah, this is the like true after a successful authentication, which then displays all of my liked Facebook pages. As you can see, hi, or high school hi was well aware that he is alive and not dead. So uh, <laughs> let's talk about data models um, and Ember data. So Ember data is a library for storing and managing the state of your data in your Ember.js applications. It comes with a variety of adapters to choose from, such as a REST adapter, JSON API adapter, and active model adapter, which plays nicely with active model serializers and rails. Um, and yeah, there's more available through open source. For my Django project, I found uh, an adapter on GitHub um, that was usable with uh, Django REST framework, so that was nice. By using Ember data, you don't have to struggle as much with managing the state of your data in your application, since it removes most of the difficulty and confusion around that. So let's see a quick example of Ember data in action. Once again, we're going to use Ember CLI to generate an adapter to be used by our entire application. I'll go more into Ember CLI and more of its commands later on, because I've been using it a lot here. And then with this REST adapter generated, we can configure it to send every single AJAX request from Ember data to the API namespace um, in our app. And this can further be configured um, for host names in case your API is hosted on an alternative subdomain or a different like server. And I kind of like to separate out my back end and my front end. Um, yeah. So next, let's generate a contact model and its respective attributes. And then here's the output from our generate command, which is perfect. Now, let's generate a route for um, displaying all of our contacts. All right, that's over and done with, but how does our root know what data corresponds to our model at this root? Through adding this model function and then making a call to store.findContact, our Ember application will send, an, um, will send an HTTP request to API slash contacts to fetch every single contact, serialize it, and store it client side. This cuts down on a significant amount of boilerplate no more having to write a lot of long AJAX calls um, in your application. And additionally, you have the state of your data handled for you by the store. So if you want, you fetch it once, and then if you want to call it again, you can just call this.store.find um, contact and a contact ID, and it'll be cached. And speaking about that, on the next slide, if you wanted to make a get request for a single contact, no problem. You just pass in the ID or another primary key, whichever it is for that um, specific resource, in addition to the model name, and you're good to go. And like I said earlier, if you already have this like loaded into your store, it'll just return to you the cache version of it, unless you want it to send off a like explicit request. Similarly, if you, you can define the data for the contact, such as their first name, last name, email, et cetera, and make a call to store.create record to send a post request and create this resource. And if you want to send server-side queries, that's not really difficult either. You can just send a JSON object with the um, relevant query params to shoot off a query to the back end and get the relevant results returned. And with access to a previously retrieved model, by changing an attribute on the model and then saving it, you'll send off a put request to update the model server-side. Calling delete record on, on this model will delete it client-side. So it'll delete it from the client-side store but you'll have to call save on this model again to persist that chain server side. So think of this as a soft delete. This is kind of helpful if you want to like maybe delete it, but then maybe roll it back if the user's like, oh no, I don't want to do that. So yeah. But then if you just want to go ahead and delete it with no confirmation, all you have to do is just use destroy record. And through these examples, you can kind of see how this can reduce the amount of overall code you write because it just abstracts those repetitive commands and functions into a very simple data store. So let's talk about another feature that I really find myself using often in my applications. Sometimes you need to have computer properties or um, properties that are dependent on the other properties of your object. So 
These can be pretty simple. For example, so here we have a computed property of full name, and this is computed off of the first name and the last name property. And then you can use this computed property in your Ember application just like any other property, and it makes your life easy. And the cool thing is, if I were to change my first name property to my whole first name, Ihai Chuku, then the full name property would change to Ihai Chuku Ekachuku. So that's pretty cool. Additionally, you got some helper functions within the computed um, function itself, such as that simplify making these computer properties, such as um, sort, greater than or equal to, difference, union. Think of like very like set theory. All those functions are pretty much in there. <clears throat> Another thing that I really like is the binding of attributes. Um, some people don't like two-way data binding. Um, I think in Ember 2.0 is one-way data binding is default and you have to explicitly set it as two-way. But in Ember 1. Point, up until like 2.0, it was like two-way data binding was the default. But this is pretty helpful for um, using with like backend images and setting URL sources. But I'm just gonna show you a simple example for a mail to link. Since we know that our models, our contact model has an email, we can just call this attribute within our HTML element and everything is all good. So we just set, we just bind that to a model.email and yeah, simple mail to link. Don't really use that often, but hey, you never know. <laughs> and whenever you have um, parts of your application that are going to be used in multiple areas, it's good to just do it into a component. And actually with Ember 2, um, with Ember 2.0, 2.1, um, it's really good to use components whenever you can because once routable components become a thing, um, they're going to deprecate, let's see, views and controllers, but um, yeah. But still, for now, you can still use controllers. Um, and if you want, and components are useful for whenever you want to wrap third-party JavaScript plugins um, and use them in your Ember application. And in my class search application, I actually used, uh, I think it was full calendar JS for like the scheduling part of it. And I just wrapped that in an Ember component and then passed in the um, course attributes into it and rendered it. So that was pretty cool. So yeah, I'm just gonna generate a simple contact card component to show how it works. And then let's just say that the contact card component has a full name and description. And that's kind of the syntax for using it. So let's say we we're using this component in the detail root, or like the detail roots template. Um, you pass the model into it, and then you just um, use that in the template, and it render the full name and the description into that contact card component. But like the beauty of this is, if we wanted to reuse the same component somewhere, like let's say in our sidebar, wherever we have all the contacts listed. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but just uh, for an example. You can pass that in, you can loop through every single contact and pass in each contact to that contact card component and it'll render the same output that is rendered within that detail root, which I find pretty cool. So let's talk about something that I really find important for developers, especially novices. I think in software development, especially for novices, communities are really important. But that being said, the Ember community is pretty freaking awesome and really, really welcoming. And this is Tomster. This is actually uh, Austin, Texas Tomster. So yeah, repping. Um, this is the official mascot for Ember.js. It's kind of interesting because like seeing a mascot like this really took the intimidation factor away from it. Because you know who's going to who's going to take that little cute thing seriously? Like, come on. Um, yeah. Um, I met most of my developer friends in Austin because of the Ember.js community. Um, shout out to the front side. The community has been really helpful. I've asked questions on Twitter, IRC, and the community Slack, and I've always gotten people eager to help me out or even offered to pair a program with me over Skype just to help me figure out what's wrong and like um, improve upon my Ember skills and my applications. So that's pretty awesome. So you probably have enough Slack channels already, like I'm up to 15, it's kind of ridiculous. But I highly suggest joining the Ember community Slack channel, even if you're just starting out there are lots of amazing people in there, and you'll find me in there a lot. So yeah, shameless plug. So let's talk about something that's really important to developers, more, it's kind of more important to community sometimes, tooling. I think that tooling is another area in which Ember really shines. I have to say that I'm really impressed with what I found in Ember um, between Ember and Spectre, 
and Ember CLI, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, between those two, I'd have to say that Ember's tooling is pretty top tier and probably the best amongst the frameworks. And actually, like Angular 2 CLI is actually forked from Ember. So they use that as their basis. So I think that says a lot. So Ember Inspector is, is Ember's debugging tool, available as an extension in your browser or as a bookmarklet. It's helpful for seeing the state of your model data, controllers, and other useful data, such as routes, deprecation warnings, promises, your um, dependency, oh yeah, and with the promises, it tells you how long these like promises and asynchronous functions, how long it took for them to execute, um, dependency in injections, and rendering performance of your application. Here's a small screen cap of Ember Inspector, and this is just more specifically focused on the data. As you can see in the right pane, we're even able to get information on the has many and belongs to relationships. And the cool thing is, if we um, actually did have those type of relationships in the right pane, you could click on the instances of those relationships and it'll pull up the relevant um, resource in the Ember Inspector so you can inspect that element's properties. So that's pretty cool in my opinion. So did you know that Heroku was actually like built as an Ember application? Pretty cool. Anyways, here's a view of Heroku's roots in Ember Inspector, and I kind of decided to use this as an example because it was way richer in roots than my boring contact application. So, yeah. So let's talk more about Ember CLI. I already gave you a little sample earlier, so let's go into more details and the internals of it and its functionality. So, what's the hype? So, ES6, or the next version of JavaScript, is pretty awesome. So if you remember that syntax that you saw earlier with export, default, and import, that was ES6. To be honest, I didn't really like writing JavaScript until I started using ES6. I mean, who does? But like, Ember CLI transpiles the ES6 modules into AMD modules and just made for a more pleasurable JavaScript development experience. <clears throat> and your vegetables are important, especially broccoli. Um, Broccoli is an asset pipeline build system for your front-end web applications. The, the beautiful thing about Broccoli as a build system is that it only rebuilds a part of your applications that have changed. So as your application scale scales and gets larger and larger in size, you're not going to get a performance um, hit from building it like continually while Ember CLI is watching it. It's just going to rebuild the parts of your app that actually changed. So, and that's important because you don't want to be losing time to long build processes. And now you're probably like, oh, yo, that's cool and all, but what about like bootstrap or preprocessors like SAS? Um, glad you asked. So let me show you. So first, let's use Bower to install bootstrap like we do in any old project. And then all you have to do is import your bootstrap file and your Ember CLI build.js file, and you're done. Under the hood, Broccoli is adding this third party dependency to a vendor.js, uh, my bad, vendor.css file and that then gets imported into your Ember application. Cool, but what about for JavaScript libraries, like Moment.js? Yep, this is looking pretty familiar. Um, and all you have to do is import the JavaScript file, and after this, you're done. Sometimes when you have non-AMD assets, you'll have to take some extra steps, but generally, it's pretty straightforward and works. Now you should have access to a global moment.js um, object in your Ember application, and this has been added to the vendor.js file, a la Broccoli. <clears throat> and for preprocessors like SAS, just run Ember install Ember CLI SAS, rename your app.css to app.scss, and that's it. No further assembly required. The pain has been taken out of getting all of this configured. <laughs> Thanks, Hove. So let's talk about how Ember allows for better productivity and collaboration amongst developers. So yeah, remember those conventions, puns, yay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, remember how we were talking about convention over configuration? Um, by using Ember CLI, it makes it easier to collaborate with your team with one really nice feature. Generators, these are nothing new, right? You have these in Ruby on Rails and other CLI tools like um, Yoman, but Ember kind of has a lot of ridiculous amounts of generators. So you all saw this command earlier for generation of roots and models and adapters, but what other generators does Ember CLI provide? 
There's essentially a generator for everything. Like, it's a pretty extensive list. Um, and once again, it's just a greatly reducing the amount of like keystrokes that you have to write out. So no more having to type out like imports and all that good stuff. And additionally, these genera generators place these files in their proper location, taking the guesswork um, out of figuring out where to place them. And that's the beauty of having convention over configuration because it allows you to immediately start learning the framework itself rather than um, how to configure it and get it working to like how you want it. And let's see, additionally, this allows for a greater organization and structure and collaborative groups um, because you don't have to worry about people using a different style for their code or how they write it um, because the generate command will give you like the import and everything correctly for like the um, models, roots, controllers, components, et cetera. Um, and yeah, this is what this is prior probably the reason why I've been able to look at open source Ember projects to figure out how they're doing um, certain things because I already know where Ember CLI is going to place the relevant business logic um, for parts of their application. So let's talk about add-ons. I know that it's pretty important to have an extensive add-on system with like some open source um, libraries and frameworks. And the ecosystem for Ember is pretty good. Ember Observer is pretty much my go-to site for whenever I need to find a specific add-on. And what I like about it is that it organizes each add-on into a category relevant to its purpose. Um, with over a thousand add-ons, I haven't had any trouble finding an add-on for a specific need yet. And even if you don't find it, it's easy to wrap it in a component and make your own. And I'm not joking when I say this, there's an add-on for almost everything. Let's look at two common examples. Need to use authentication in your application? Just use Ember Simple Auth. It makes the handling of your sessions easy on the client side of things, in addition to simplifying user authentication and authorization. Through its adapter pattern, I've had no problem using Simple Auth with Devise and Ruby on Rails, or using it to, um, for authenticating via Facebook Connect, like I did in my uh, page and like application. That was all client side, um, by the way. I didn't have a backend for that app. So just using local storage for handling that. And what if you want to build out your front end, but your back end developer isn't done yet, but you already know what the API structure is going to be like? Sometimes you want to have a mock API service to use for writing your test until your back end API is completely fleshed out or you can test against the real thing in integration. And I just discovered Ember CLI Mirage recently, but for my brief usage of it, it's pretty impressive. Here we define our factory, symmetrical to the contact model that we defined earlier and is being populated with fake data. And now we can define our API endpoints. For brevity, we're just going to use get request. And here we are stating that we want to create 10 contacts and then we're done. And now we can fetch these contacts in the relevant route. And of course, Let's display them. And here's the uh, final product. It's pretty simple and pretty handy, so pretty nice. So I always say that testing is important and you should do it for the kids. Um, that said, I've had nightmares over writing front end test, but Ember CLI makes testing painless and for the few times I've done it, it's actually been pretty enjoyable. By default, Ember ships with QUnit for running its test. So let's see an example on how we test our contacts route. So let's generate an acceptance test first, uh, TDD style. And here we're setting up the uh, acceptance test. In the actual testing block, we're creating the mock values with Mirage and then visiting the contacts route to make sure that there are 10 contacts displayed in our front end. And by visiting the test route in your Ember application, um, my bad, in your browser, at your Ember app, you can watch your test run in the browser and see this, um, the results. And if you like your coffee like Mocha, like I do, then it's pretty easy to use that instead of QUnit. Just gonna use that handy Ember install command to install Ember CLI Mocha. And then whenever you generate a test, it'll generate it using uh, Mocha's testing syntax and I added in the um, server creation for creating 10 contact routes. And it's just been modified to use like the Mocha structure, but we can still visit that test route in our browser. 
and see what's going on here. So yeah, the first one, acceptance test. Um, good stuff right here. Acceptance list contacts, it works, it shows you the execution time. Pretty cool. And what if you just want to run your test from the command line? Or how does it get um, how does it get run in Travis or Circle CI or continuous integration? All you have to do is use the Ember test command. This runs the test and then tells you the outcome of the test results. And if you want to continuously run a test server as you are developing your application, just append a server flag onto your Ember test command and you're good to go. And it'll rerun the test on any change that you make inside of your um, application directory. Well, to JavaScript files at least. Yeah. And deploying front-end applications can sometimes be a pain, especially when you have to decide whether to keep your front and back ends uh, deployed simultaneously or separately. So for keeping it separate, it's pretty, it's pretty best to use Ember CLI deploy. Um, it once again uses an adapter pattern, so it just adds an API that like makes it easy for people to like build their own third-party uh, plugins that plug into it. Um, and it just allows for flexibility to, de to deploy to multiple platforms. So there's adapters that exist for deploying to Azure, Redis, and Amazon S3. All you have to do is use NPM to install Ember CLI deploy in addition to the adapter of your choice, and of course configure it. And then run Ember deploy environment production and you're good to go. But what about for static hosting um, through services like Firebase? And actually, I didn't get time to update this, but there's one called PageFront that was just released, and it's pretty cool, so I checked that one out as well. And the reason I have Firebase here is because I did have DivShot on here before, but the Firebase team at Google acquired them and is rolling it into their static hosting service, so I just uh, replaced it because it was relevant at the time. And yeah, so Firebase is really helpful. Like I said, I used to use DivShot after Heroku started playing games with my free dino. But yeah, DivShot was acquired by Firebase and had to, you know, update that. All you have to do is install Firebase tools globally. And then you just got to configure the um, project for deployment in its root directory. And then we just deploy using the Firebase deploy command and you're done. And if you're trying um, to deploy to a platform as a service such as Heroku or IBM Bluemix, fortunately, there's a build pack for that. And here it is for Heroku. And here it is for Bluemix via Cloud Foundry. Since all these deployment methods are running the Ember build command prior to pushing um, it to the service of your choice, you get the benefits of minification, fingerprinting of your assets, once again, along for greater productivity with less configuration. Because normally, like if you have to set that all up yourself, sometimes it gets annoying to debug those like caching errors from your CSS or static files in general. Getting started with Ember CLI is really simple. All you have to do is install Ember CLI globally, create a new project, and now you're ready to dive in with all the new information gained today. Have fun. Yep. Yeah. I don't know, how, how am I doing on time? 420s, like, uh, wow. Anyways, 420s, uh, my, <laughs> sorry, I'm so young. <laughs> like, high school. It's like 420 Blizzard, but yeah. Anyways. <laughs> 414. 414. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can answer questions if anybody has any. Come on, y'all. Y'all have to have something, like anything. Uh, what's up? Uh, so uh, before this, no, since I started working at IBM, I've like dabbled with Angular and I'm also on a project I'm on right now, we're using React with the 
I'm the front end engineering leader when using React and Redux. But uh, actually, I saw Angular and I looked at I was like scopes, directives. I'm just like, nope, close browser tab. <laughs> and, um, but um, and like I just wanted to like get started running because like you had to figure out how to like configure Angular. Every single open source repo I looked at had different ways of organizing their controllers, services, directives, and I was on a tight deadline for my classes, right? So I was just like, okay, just give me something that works. And Ember was the only one that fit that bill. And Backbone was too like bare bones for this project. So. But since then, I've dabbled with it, and I've like been able to see like what each one does best, and like where each one like uh, excels and falls short at. What's up? I think Flux was really inspired by uh, the whole way that Ember Data handles um, the way Ember Data handles its data. But I think the difference between Flux and um, Ember Data, well, it depends. Which Flux implementation are you talking about? Because there's like 30 of them. But if we're talking about like, like a common one, like in Flux, so in Ember Data, every single one has like, like there's just like one store. There's not a concept of like, in Flux, like with um, Alt.js or other ones, you have one store for each of your like data models or resources. And I think the most similar Flux implementation to Ember's data store is Redux because it just has one store and that state is preserved within that and you're um, transforming that. And I think the difference between Flux and Ember Data is that Ember Data does all of this for you internally, but with like Redux, you kind of have to, you're on your own on implementing that yourself and having to figure out how that works. Any more? Come on y'all, something like after this adventure, like you can even be casual, like what's my favorite color? All right. Orange? No, no, it's blue. It's blue <laughs> and red, but yeah, patriotic. Anyways, yeah, if no more questions, uh, I'm out. Thanks, y'all.